of strength. Oh yes, it is chapter four, the trial of strength. Dear devotees, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Sri Lanka Prabhupada. I would like to warmly welcome His Holiness, Bhakti Vigna Vinasha, Narasimha Maharaj, to today's uh, Ramayana Katha reading. So today we are doing uh, day three of Ramayana Katha reading. Uh, you, you can unmute your, your mic to welcome uh, Maharaj. You can say, Hare Krishna to Maharaj, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Yeah, so, so thank you for... Hare Krishna. Yeah. We are so fortunate to have the association, uh, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Recording in progress. Thank you very much Maharaj for giving blessing us with your with this uh, Maharaj okay okay don't take so much time you just have to say Hare Krishna please don't take so much time go ahead Sri Devi okay thank you Guru Maharaj so uh, I think we stopped here dear devotees remember we stopped here yesterday because this chapter was rather long so we will continue with this uh, reading of chapter 4 so chapter 4 is the trial of strength. So we'll just continue here. So uh, as usual, you use your raise hand function. We don't, we, we only have for one hour to do about two chapters. We'll try to do five and six. Uh, if possible, that'll be wonderful. Okay, so use your raise hand function and then uh, we'll follow the queue, raise hand function queue. So it'll be wonderful if all of you can participate. Guru Maharaj, like to read first, Guru Maharaj? Mm -hmm. Beginning from what? As the two kings? Uh, the, fo the following morning, Dasharada rose oh, early. Oh, okay. The following morning, Dasharada rose early and performed the first ritual for invoking good fortune. He had his four sons brought before him and then, give, and then gave to the Brahmana priest a hundred thousand cows on behalf of each of them. The emperor also distributed gold and gems to the thousands of rishis assembled in Mithila to witness the wedding. The four princes shaved their heads and dressed in silk robes, putting on brilliant jeweled ornaments. Surrounded by the four handsome and effulgent youths, Dasarath shone like Brahma, surrounded by the celestial guardians of the four quarters. A great pavilion had been erected for the ceremony. Its walls were constructed of marble and it was supported on numerous pillars studded with sparkling gems. Fragrant and brightly colored flower garlands were draped everywhere and the air was filled with the scent of black aloe incense. Large stands constructed of mahogany inlaid with coral and pearl, holding rows of golden seats surrounded the sacrificial area. Kings from all around the world, along with their ministers, filled the stands eager to see the wedding. The entire pavilion, the entire pavilion was crowded with jubilant people who cried out, all glories to Rama and Sita. Hundreds of elderly Brahmins wearing simple loincloths with clean white threads hanging from their left shoulders were seated around the sacrificial arena. They recited Vedic hymns continuously and the melody and, and the melodic rise and fall of their Metrical chanting filled the pavilion. Musical instruments played 
while expert singers sang the praises of Rama and Sita, the whole assembly appeared like an exuberant festival held in the heavens by the gods. Dataras and his four sons approached the sacrificial fire, which was rendered by Vishista. When they were seated, the prince saw Sita and the other three princesses enter the arena. The prince's minds were captivated by the beauty of their wives-to-be, adorned with shining silk garments, jewels, and gold ornaments. The princesses appeared like four goddesses descended from the celestial realm. They sat, they sat down opposite their intended spouses, glancing down shyly, and Vish Janaka stepped forward, speaking in a voice choked with emotion. My dear Rama, I now give to you Sita to be your assistant in all your religious duties. She will always remain exclusively devoted to you and will follow you like you accept her. I bless you both. Janaka took Ram's hand and sprinkled sanctified water over their clasped hands, signifying the confirmation of the gift of Sita. Holding Sita's hand, Rama left her, led her slowly around the sacred fire. From the upper reaches of the pavilion, gods were heard to exclaim, Excellent! Bravo! Celestial flowers rained down upon Rama and Sita. The entire assembly of onlookers erupted with a shout of joy. Both Dasarath and Janaka looked with tearful eyes at the newlywed couple. Rama's complexion, resembling a celestial emerald, contrasted the pure white features of Sita. They were both covered with golden flower petals, and their many jewels shone brilliantly. As they walked hand in hand around the fire, Sita looked down in shyness, while Rama smiled at the loudly cheering crowds in the pavilion. Each of Rama's three brothers, one after another, in order of their seniority, took the hand of one of the other three princesses. Lakshman was united with Urmila, Bharat with Mandavi, and Shatrugna with Shrutakirti. The three fulgent princes, holding their bride's hands, went around the sacred fire along with Janaka and the many sages. Cries of happiness filled the pavilion while the gods played their celestial drums, bevies of apsaras danced and Gandharvas sang. The sages recited Vedic texts and the blast of conch shells was heard everywhere. All those present in the assembly were lost in ecstasy. The ceremony ended at midday and the kings and princesses gradually retired to their tents, headed by Dasarath, Janaka, and the four newly married couples. The following day, Vishwamitra, after taking permission from both Dasarath and Janaka, left for the northern Himalayan ranges, his mind intent on the performance of asceticism. Janaka bestowed upon his daughters a dowry consisting of hundreds of thousands of cows and an equal number of elephants, horses, chariots, and foot soldiers. The king, whose wealth was virtually unlimited, gave away millions of pieces of silken and cotton textiles tens of thousands of hand-woven carpets, heaps of gold, silver, and jewels, and hundreds of richly adorned maids for each of the brides. 
After a few days, Dasarath left for Ayodhya, proceeding at the head of a large army. As a king surrounded by his sons and the host of sages was traveling along the broad road that led to Ayodhya, he suddenly saw a strange omen. Birds began to cry out fearfully and swoop low over their heads. Wit witnessing this foreboding sign, Dasara's heart quivered and his mind became fearful. The king asked Vashishta if he knew the cause of those omens. These signs portend some grave danger, replied the Rishi. But here are groups of deer crossing our path from left to right. This indicates our deliverance from that danger. You should not fear. A fierce tempest blew up. The sun was enveloped in darkness and the sky became black. Trees crashed to the ground and the earth shook. A dreadful dust storm swirled around the travelers, conf confounding their senses. They were rendered virtually unconscious. Suddenly, from out of the darkness, appeared the terrible sage Parasurama. He was dressed in tiger skins and had matted locks coiled at the crown of his head. Dasarath and his followers immediately recognized him. Although a Brahmin, Parasurama was famous for his prowess as a fighter. In former ages, he had single-handedly overcome the world's warriors annihilating them by the millions. The sage had become enraged when his father was killed by warrior kings, and he wreaked an awful vengeance. He, he had ranged the globe, massacring the entire warrior caste. He now stood before Dasarat, holding a battle axe in one hand, and in the other hand, a fierce arrow which resembled a streak of lightning. He was as tall as two men, and he had upon his shoulders a great bow, appearing as irresistible as the fire of universal destruction. He blocked the path like an impassable mountain. The sages in Dhatarasi's party gathered together quickly. They took water to wash Parashrama's feet and hands and offered him gentle words of welcome. Accepting the honor offered by the sages, Parasurama looked at Rama and said in a grave voice, O oh Rama, I have heard of your strength. By breaking Shiva's bow, you have performed an incredible feat. How can I, who has formed a great enmity with all warriors, tolerate hearing of such prowess existing in a king? I have here another sacred bow, that of Vishnu. Let me see your power now. Fit this celestial arrow upon this bow and simply draw it to its full length. If you are able to accomplish this task, then I shall challenge you to single combat. When you stand on the battlefield and are swept away by the force of my weapons, you shall earn undying fame. Dasarath threw up his hands in horror. Knowing well of Parasurama's power, he feared for Rama's life. He approached the sage with joined palms and entreated him to spare Rama. Paying no heed, 
at all to the king. Parashurama continued to speak only to Rama. Both the bow broken by you and this one here were constructed by the architect of the gods, Vishwakarma. The one you sundered formerly belonged to Shiva. However, this one here was Vishnu's property. It is thus more powerful than the one you broke, for Vishnu is always Shiva's superior. Parasurama took the bow from his shoulder. With furrowed brows, he gazed at Rama with bloodshot eyes, not immediately recognizing the prince's divine identity. The bow has been passed down from Vishnu to my ancestors and finally to me. I now offer it to you, O Rama, considering your sacred duty as a warrior to always accept a challenge. Exhibit now the strength of your arms. Parasurama held out the enormous bow. Rama, smiling slightly, stepped forward. I have heard of your tremendous feat in fighting and killing all the world's warriors 21 times. You have fully avenged your father with this commendable action. Even as a child, Rama had been told the story of Parasurama. The many kings killed by that sage had become debauched and it was by divine arrangement that they had been annihilated. As a sage, Parasurama had performed much asceticism and had finally been personally empowered by Vishnu himself. By dint of Vishnu's own desire and power, Parasurama had been able to exterminate the warrior class. Now Vishnu appearing as Rama again stood before the sage. He continued to speak. You are a Brahmana sage and are therefore worthy of my worship. However, since you despise me, seeing me to belong to the warrior caste, I shall now display to you my personal prowess. Rama seized the bow along with the blazing arrow from Parasurama's hand. He strung the bow in an instant and drew the bow back to his ear. Looking angrily at Parasuram, he asked, Where shall I discharge this deadly shaft, O sage? As you are my superior, I dare not aim it at you. Hosts of gods had assembled in the sky. Seeing the celestial bow drawn in anger by Rama and fearing that he may destroy the heavens, they cried out, Vishnu, save us, save us. Rama, standing with the bow, blazed as brilliant as the sun, and Parasurama fell back in astonishment. He felt his own power completely eclipsed by Rama. Suddenly realizing Rama's identity, the sage spoke in faltering tones. You appear invincible, and I can understand you must surely be the imperishable Vishnu himself. I accept defeat, but I am not shamed as you are indeed the Lord of all the worlds. All right, somebody else like to take over from here? Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Anyone? Okay, Prabhu, Sharan Raj Prabhu, carry on. Thank you, Prasuram reclaimed how Vishnu had long ago said he would come again to take back the divine energy he had given to the sage. 
the warrior sage folded his palms and said, O Rama, O all-powerful one, you have already divested me of my power and my pride. Please release this arrow upon my desire for heavenly pleasure and thereby burn them all the ashes. I wish only to serve you with all my material aspiration destroyed by you. I shall be fit to become your eternal servant. This is my deepest desire. Parashuram, Parashurama's bow low before Rama, who then fired the fearful shaft. The sage immediately vanished along with the arrow. Then Varuna, the god of the water, appeared and Rama gave him the celestial bow to keep on behalf of the gods. The exchange between Rama and the sage was heard and understood only by Vashishta and a few other spiritually powerful Brahmins. The king and the other pres others present had been wholly confirmed by the event that had occurred. They were amazed and re re relieved to see that Rama had somehow appeased the sage. Everything again became calm and the party resumed their journey, soon approaching Ayodhya. Word had already reached Ayodhya of, a, of the approach of Dasharada's party. Thousands of Brahmins and citizens had, so, had come some mile out of the city to greet them. They stood along the white road throwing rice grains and fresh green leaves in front of Dasharada. Seated, uh, seated aboard his chariot, the emperor of his sons waved at the people. They moved slowly through the crowds and entered the city instead. It was decorated with flags and festoons and strewn all over the flower. Trumpet fanfare sounded and joy, joyous people thrown around the king's party as it went slowly along the main thoroughfare. Dasharada ent entered his own white marble palace, which resembled mountain Himavad. He was greeted by his wives who had organized a ceremony reception for their son and new daughters-in-law. After the greeting, the prince and princess went to their respective palaces and began to enjoy life in Ayodhya exactly like the gods in heaven. After a few weeks, Dasharada asked Bharata and Shatrugana to go to the kingdom of their father-in-law, Kushkadvaja, who himself had no son. The emperor instructed the prince to assist Kushadvaja in the affair of state. Along with their wives and a large army, Bharata and Shatrugana therefore soon left the capital and went to Rajagriya where Kushadvaja lived. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Hare Krishna, thank you so much. Now we will go on to the next chapter, which is the crooked advice for Queen Taiki. In the second. anyone raising their hands yet so I'll just start here chapter 5 crooked advice for Queen Tai King the aging Dasharada thinking of his retirement gradually entrusted more and more of the state affairs to Rama and Lakshman those two princes along with their wives served the king in every way they always thought of the welfare of the people everyone became pleased with their disposition and conduct they were gentle and kind but firm when necessary they demonstrated complete mastery of the military arts and having slain the powerful Rakshasas even while boys were respected as great heroes. Rama was especially dear to the king and the people. He was always tranquil and soft-spoken, not retorting even when someone spoke harshly to him. He recognized the smallest of services rendered and did not take to heart any wrongs against him. Rama had conquered anger and was full of compassion. Making all arrangements to protect the people, he surrounded himself with intelligent advisors and never made a decision without due consultation. Despite his power and ability, 
He always remained humble, mild, and self-controlled. He was not influenced by envy or hatred, did not engage in frivolous talks, and always sought the good in others. Free from sloth, he was ever vigilant to carry out his duty. Rama gave delight to even the gods who frequently graced Ayodhya with their presence. He was as tolerant as Mother Earth, as wise as Prahaspati, and as valorous as Indra. His personal beauty was as resplendent as the brilliant sun god. Dasharada, seeing his son endowed with so many virtues, longed to see him installed as the prince regent. The king discussed his desire with his ministers and priests. They all unanimously agreed that Rama, as the eldest son, was the rightful heir to the throne and that, and that he would be the most popular choice of the people. However, when the royal astrologers were calculating a favorable time for the coronation, they discovered dreadful signs in the heavens portents that indicated that some calamity would soon occur. Dasharada became concerned. The omens must surely foretell of his own impending death. He decided to perform the ceremony quickly at the earliest opportune moment. Having set a day for Rama's installation, he summoned to Ayodhya rulers and important men from around the globe. But the gods so arranged that Dasharada, in his haste, neglected to invite King Kushatvaja. Thus, neither Varada nor Satrugana came for the ceremony. Dasharada realized too late his omission, for it was a journey of some days to Rajagriha. Nevertheless, he considered that the two absent sons would soon receive the delightful news of their elder brother's installation. He felt sure they would be overjoyed and would not take offense. Soon a large gathering of kings and brahmins appeared in Ayodhya and Dasharada had them assembled in the royal court. Sitting in state in the assembly, the emperor blazed forth like Indra in the midst of the gods. He spoke in a pleasing and melodious voice, which was at the same time sonorous and grave. All of you know how the earth has long been protected by me and the kings who previously appeared before me in my life. To the best of my ability, I have ruled the people, giving protection, even at the expense of personal comforts. My body has become worn out in the shade of the royal umbrella. Carrying on my shoulders the burden of governing the globe, I have become old. I wish now to bestow this kingdom upon one well suited to take my place. Here is my beloved and eldest son, Rama, who wives with the king of the gods in all virtues. With the agreement of my closest advisors and in accordance with custom and law, I desire to place Rama at the head of the state. With your permission, therefore, the ceremony will take place tomorrow morning. Dasharada looked around the vast assembly of kings and sages. All of them gazed at him intensely as he spoke. The king saw Dasharada as the leader of the entire earth. They all had affection for the old emperor who always administered the law with justice and compassion. They willingly paid him tribute and sought his guidance in the affairs of state management. Dasharada oversaw the world situation, ensuring that the different kings and leaders all ruled according to the codes of religion. All the assembled kings felt that Rama was the perfect choice to succeed Dasharada. As the emperor looked at his obedient and gentle son, he was moved by love. He continued to speak with tears running from his eyes. Rama, who possesses every desirable quality, will be your worthy protector and even the universe will be better ruled with him as emperor. If my plan finds favor with you, then be pleased to give your consent. Otherwise, if you consider that some other cause should be taken, then speak out. Perhaps you may find me overly attached to Rama, choosing him when a better choice could be found. The views of the dispassionate are always to be sought when deciding a difficult issue. The whole assembly was filled with delight upon hearing Dasharada speak. They erupted with loud acclamations of joy, even as a crowd of peacocks would, even as a crowd of peacocks would acclaim the appearance of a large rain cloud. The sound echoed all around Ayodhya, seeming to shake the earth. Let it be so, let it be so, was heard everywhere, and every man was in agreement. Stepping forward, 
a leader of the Brahmins said, You have long protected us with love, O King. Now you have a worthy son and can retire peacefully. Pray install Rama as the Prince Regent, for he alone deserves to be a successor. We long to see Rama riding upon the great royal elephant, his head shielded by the white umbrella. Hare Krishna, anyone like to continue? Yes, Prabhu, Minachi Sundra Prabhu, please carry on. Upon hearing. Hare Krishna, everyone. Upon hearing. Can you hear me? Yes, Hare Krishna. I can hear you, Prabhu. Okay, stepping forward. Upon hearing the SM, the SM. Oh, upon hearing the assembly voice, their unanimous agreement to Rama's installation, Dasarada stood up. His eyes flooded with tears of joy. It is fortunate for me and indeed the world that you all wish to see Rama succeed me as king. This confirms my decision. I shall begin the arrangements for Rama's installation immediately. Dasarada came down from his throne and approached Vasista, touching his feet. With your permission, O holy Brahmin, we shall proceed with the ceremony tomorrow. If you are agreeable, then please make all preparations. So be it, Vasista replied, and he immediately commanded the king's ministers to set about making ready all of the items required for the installation of the following day. The assembly then dispersed with a loud clamor and shouts of victory to Rama were heard everywhere. That night, however, Dasarada remembered the astrological predictions. He became fearful and called for Rama. Speaking with him in private, Dasarada said, I have enjoyed a long life and have always protected the people to the best of my ability. In thousands of religious ceremonies, I have bestowed abundant charity. By sacrifice, worship, and charity, I have repaid my debt to the gods, the Brahmins, and the forefathers. I have also satisfied myself through the enjoyment of numerous pleasures. All that remains for me to do is to install you as my successor. Dasarada clutched Rama close to his bosom. The king's body trembled and his eyes shed tears. He desperately longed for his son to succeed him. At last it was imminent. Surely no evil destiny could prevent it now. Would not even the gods desire to see this magnificent prince become the king? Dasarada revealed his concerns to Rama, telling him of the malefic stars. He also told his son of the many bad dreams he had recently experienced. My dear Rama, due to seeing all these omens, your installation has been sought swiftly by me before any problems arise. With your good wife, Sita, make offerings into the sacrificial fire tonight. At sunrise tomorrow, we shall commence the installation ceremony. Rama nodded in agreement and then bowed to and took his leave from the king. He went back to his palace and along with Sita, sat before the sacrificial fire making offerings to Vishnu. The news of Rama's installation quickly spread around the city, delighting everyone. The temples were thrown with people offering gifts and worshipping the gods. As evening fell, the city streets were filled with a flurry of joyous citizens. The large crowds of men moving about Ayodhya resembled the tossing waves of the ocean. Everyone spoke only of the installation. Poets and bards composed songs about the occasion. Flags were hoisted high on the housetops, and garlands of forest flowers were draped, were draped everywhere. Colorful festoons hung across the streets, which were swept and sprinkled with perfumed water. Shining lamps hung from every tree lining the streets. The city echoed everywhere with the loud chanting of Vedic hymns. Elephants and bulls roared on all sides, and the whole atmosphere threw with excitement. No one could wait for sunrise when the ceremony would commence. In the palace of Kaikei, the king's youngest queen, there was the hunchbacked 
made servant call mantra mantara upon seeing the celebrations mantara approached rama's former nurse and inquired what occasion gives rise to this display of delight on every side is the emperor going to perform some great sacrifice the nurse her face blooming with happiness told mantara about the king's decision to install rama as the higher apparent tomorrow under favorable stars our lord dasharatha will give to the sinless rama the office of prince regent what greater occasion for joy could there be mantara's mind recoiled at this news she was immediately seized with anger surely this was a disaster with rama installed as king a mistress kaikeyi would soon fall out of favor her own son barada being left as nothing more than rama's servant mantara raged within herself she had long enjoyed special privileges as kaikeyi's senior maid servant the emperor particularly liked her mistress who had given mantara the esteem she desired as a hunchback she had always been the butt of jokes and abuse among the other servants but as her mistress became more influential the other servants even those of the senior queen kaushalya had been obliged to pay her respect anyone else anyone anyone else mata ji vaishnava vani mata ji or shamala mata ji chandipi mata ji who else is here is the daumi mata ji here she couldn't come to be who else otherwise i can continue i uh, yes prabhu to be see another person raise hand Okay. Um, I think Vaishnava. So I think it. Are you read for a while, Prabhu? Then after that, followed by Vaishnava Vani Amata Ji. Okay. So, sighing with anxiety, Mantara ran to Kaigai's room, where she found the queen lying upon a couch, with her face flushed. She began addressing her bemused mistress in harsh tones. Get up, foolish woman! How can you lay there? when calamity stares you in the face you languish here at ease even as a flood of misery sweeps towards you thoroughly neglected by your husband you are threatened now with utter ruin kaige looked affectionately at the servant mantara had been her childhood nurse and kaige saw her like her own mother the queen had not heard the news about rama and she inquired from mantara pray Tell me what causes you sorrow at this time? You seem sorely afflicted. Mantara became even more incensed upon hearing Kaikeyi's question. She replied in a low voice, trembling with anger, "There is no doubt that disaster now threatens us both. With your destruction will come mine, as much as with your good fortune rests mine. I am therefore saying this only for your benefit." She grasped Kaikeyi's hand, trying to impress upon her mistress what appeared to her to be the obvious facts. Although born in a royal line, you seem ignorant of the ways of kings. A king will speak sweet words to a person while at the same time planning their destruction. The emperor has acted as your beloved spouse while performing deeds which will ruin you to the very roots. Kaikeyi sat up and looked at her servant curiously. Mantara's eyes blazed as she continued having sent your own son Bharata away to a distant kingdom this wicked king now plans to install Rama as prince regent what greater misfortune could there be for you kaigeyi smiled she loved Rama as much as her own dear son while Rama for his part looked upon kaigeyi as being equal to his own mother Kaushalya She felt a surge of joy upon hearing Mantara's report. She could not understand why Mantara was disturbed. Why was she so vehement? If anyone else had spoken about Dasaratha and Rama in such a way, she would have had them punished. But Kaigeyi was accustomed to her servant's sullen temperament. She felt she felt there was no malice in Mantara, despite her open, angry expressions. Okay, Mataji. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Now, Vaishnava Vani. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Carry on taking from her. 
टेकिंग फ्रॉम हर बॉसम ए नेकलेस ऑफ ब्रिलियंट डायमंड सेट इन गोल्ड कहके ही हैंडेड इट टू हर सर्वेंट एंड सेड माय डियर दात्री दिस इज श्योरली द बेस्ट न्यूज यू हैव एवर ब्रॉट मी माय हार्ट स्वेल्स विद प्लेजर एट हियरिंग योर वर्ड्स व्हिच सीम टू बी लाइक नेक्टर I wish to reward you. Take this gift and tell me if there is anything else I can do for you. Mantara threw down the necklace and began rebuking Kaigegi. There is no occasion for joy, foolish lady. What strange frame of mind has seized you? An ocean of grief threatens to overwhelm you and yet you stand here smiling. Your stepson Rama will become king while your own son Bharata is left aside. Bharata's claim to the throne is the same as Rama and thus Rama will see him as an enemy. Lakshman serves only Rama and Shatrughna serves your son. Therefore it is only Rama or Bharata who may be crowned as the sovereign of this world. My mind quakes with fear to think of the danger to your son from the powerful Rama once he is king. Mantara's eyes grew bloodshot with fury and her face whitened as she spoke. Why was Kaikeyi not understanding? Kausalya had long been snubbed by the king in favor of Kaikeyi. When Rama became the king, that would all change. Kausalya would be exalted to the highest level, while Kaikeyi would lose her special special position as the king's most favorite consort. Kausalya would certainly exact a revenge for her long suffering. Kaigeyi would become Kausalya's maid servant and Bharata would at best be Rama's servant more likely he would be exiled where would that leave Kaigeyi's servants praying to the gods to help her the hunchback maid became more ardent in her plea you must do something this is a great disaster once the crown has passed to the other side of your family you will in time see in your own sight sink into oblivion bereft of all royal fortune hearing the strong submission from her servant the beautiful kaikeyi thought of rama she could not imagine him bearing any ill will toward bharata mantara's fears were quite groundless rama always acted in perfect perfect accord with religious principles He was devoted to truth, disciplined and always kind. He doubtlessly deserved to be king. After he was crowned, he would surely look after his younger brothers like a father. Mantara had no reason to feel such distress. Kaigegi subsided her gently. When such an occasion for rejoicing has come, you should by no means give away to grief, my dear maid servant. Nor should you think ill of Rama. My son Bharata will be in no danger from Rama and in the future he may well succeed him to the throne there is no need for lamentation Mantara would not be placated placated in order to improve her own position she wanted her mistress to be the mother of the king blinded by her own greed and envy Mantara considered the emperor to be acting from similar motivation She continued to besiege Kaikeyi in increasingly rancorous tones. Surely it is due only to it is due only to stupidity that you fail to see your impending doom. Oh deluded one, Rama will be crowned king and after him he will become his, he will come his son. When there will Bharata be left? Not all the sons of a king can assume the throne. It falls only to one among them. Having taken hold of the throne, Rama will ensure that it goes to his own son if necessary by banishing Bharata or perhaps even by sending him to the next world. You and your line will be lost and forsaken. I am here to awaken you to a great peril now arrived at your door. Do not disregard me. Mantara's lofty position in the palace has gone to her head. She was furious at the prospect of losing her status and she continued to present many arguments to her mistress. She played upon the natural rivalry existing between the king's co-wives. Kaigeyi's affection for Rama was deep and the discussion went back and forth for some time. but gradually mantara began to change her mistress mind by the god's arrangement her arguments swayed kaigeyi's mind and the queen's intelligence became confused although she loved rama she began to consider this installation was an injustice 
Mantara saw in Kaigegi's space that her mind was wavering. She grasped the queen's hands. There is a way by which we may not be ruined. If Rama can be sent to the forest and Barada installed in his place, then the sovereignty may be secured in your life. This idea has entered Mantara's mind by the sudden inspiration of the gods. Kaigegi, intrigued, looked at her servant. How can this be accomplished? Mantara recalled the story she had heard from her mistress many years earlier. Some time ago, you told me how you once went with your husband when he was assisting Indra in a battle against the demons. Having fought hard one day, your husband lay unconscious on the battlefield, his body severely wounded. A grave danger beset him then from a demon who could come at night to devour the bodies of the warriors still on the field. Kaigegi remembered the incident. Many years back, the emperor had gone to the heavens, taking Kaigegi with him. He was famed as an invincible warrior and the gods had asked him as his assistant in a fight. At that time, he had fought so powerfully that his chariot appeared to be facing ten directions simultaneously and the gods have therefore named him the Sarada or ten chariots. Mantara continued, at that time, seeing the danger, to Dasarada, you rode out in a chariot and rescued your lord. Upon recovering, he offered you a couple of boons, but you deferred them to a time when you might need them most. Surely that time has come now. Go to Dasarada and ask that he banish Rama and install Barada in his place as the prince regent. In this way, we shall be both be saved. Despite her love for her husband and attachment for Rama, Kaigei became convinced by Mantara's arguments. She was upset. How could the king have treated him her such a way? He was always so kind and loving. Was all that a show to win her favor? She began to feel angry. The king might have spoken so many sweet words to her, but by his behavior, it was obvious that he favored Kausalya. They had probably even conspired together have Barada sent away. Why had she not realized it before? It was obvious. Now the whole situation was revealed. The Sarada had shown his real feelings by completely neglecting her and favoring Kausalya's son instead. Kaikegi heaved that doleful sigh. Your suggestion finds favor with me, Mantara. I shall this very moment go before the king and ask of him is these wounds. Thank you, Mantaji. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Mantaji. Anybody else who hasn't read yet? Just use the raise hand function. So, all may like to read. Maharaj? Yes, yes Guru Maharaj. Uh, yeah, I can read. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, to me. No. Mantara's mind. Mantara's mind was full of cunning. Her eyes narrowed. You should ask that Rama be banished for no less than 14 years. Within that time, your son Bharat will become dear to the people and he will be firmly established on the throne. Mantara intelligently knew that Bharat would never become the king in Rama's presence. The people would not allow it to happen. Even the humble Bharata himself almost surely, would almost surely not accede to such an arrangement. Rama had to be banished. The maidservant continued, Do not allow Rama to remain in the kingdom. By his power and influence, he will seize the throne, even if Bharat is crowned. Your son has long been away while Rama has been here, winning the hearts of the people. 
It is imperative that Rama be sent away for a long time. Kaike listened with full attention as her maidservant revealed her insidious plan. Listen as I tell you the means of approaching the king. Putting on soil garments, you should go to the sulking chamber and lay down on the bare floor with your ornaments cast about and your hair in disarray, lay there weeping. Mantara knew that her mistress was guileless by nature. The queen would not have acted politically, even though angered, but her servant led her along. She spoke of Dathara's special affection for her youngest and most beautiful wife, for his youngest and most beautiful wife. The king will never be able to tolerate your sullen mood. He cannot, he, he cannot ignore you. He cannot ignore your order for your sake. He would enter fire and even lay down his very life. Using the power of your charms, you will easily achieve your ends, O oh beautiful lady. Clenching her fist, Kaike sat on her bed, spread with a pure white silk sheet. Mantara was right. The king obviously liked her for something. if only her beauty and charm. Every evening he spent time with her. Tonight he would be in for a surprise. Kai Ke came fully under the sway of anger as Mantara continued. When the king sees you distraught, he will take you up and offer you anything. He will present priceless gems and pearls in order to pacify you. Do not be, do not be distracted from your goal of banishing Rama. Insist upon the two boons long ago given by your Lord. Take these boons now, O Queen. Demand the exile of Rama and the coronation of Bharat. Although Mantara showed her mistress an evil course disguised as good, Kaike accepted her advice. Kind, gentle, and wise by nature, Kaike nevertheless lost her good sense under the influence of her envious maid. Considering her husband and Rama as enemies, she, sp she spoke with hot, heavy breaths. You have given me good counsel, O oh wise woman. I have been cheated by the king. You have acted as my well-wisher by pointing this out. When my son is installed on the throne, I shall confer upon you numerous boons and much wealth. Mantara smiled and urged Kaike to, to, to make haste. Let us go quickly to the inner room, for the king will shortly come for his evening visit with you. You should by no means stand by as Rama is made prince regent. Act swiftly for the interests of your son and your own self. Kaike was pierced again and again by Mantara's sharp words. The servant repeatedly spoke against the king and Rama, asking Kaike's, and, and, and Rama stoking Kaike's anger more. Arriving at the sulking chamber, the queen threw herself on the floor and said to Mantara, Either Rama is exiled and Bharat made king, or I shall remain here 
in this state, taking neither food nor water. If my desire is not fulfilled, then you shall see me depart from this spot for the region of the dead. With her ornaments scattered and her garland crushed, Kaike lay on the beautiful mosaic floor, appearing like a goddess fallen from the heavens, her face dark with rage. She tossed about and sobbed. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, everyone, dear devotees. So we stop here at the we finish chapter five. So tomorrow we will do chapter six, the King's Heartbreak. It's been such an enjoyable session, and we are very fortunate and blessed to have His Holiness Bhakti Vidyavinasha Narasimha Maharaj read with us today. Thank you very much to all of you who have taken time and trouble to come. Hare Krishna. See you tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.